Hi, my name is Dr. Cynthia Kardish. I am the Integrative Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Physician here at Palm Health. Thank you so much for joining me in this webinar on staying fit in menopause and beyond. Today, we're going to talk about how our body composition changes for as we age. In particular, the body composition of our fat distribution. Things that we do not like are the fat distribution of, around our waist, our thickening middle. So today we're gonna to spend time talking about the reason that occurs and the non-pharmacologic treatment that we can do to mitigate these changes. We're gonna discuss our hormonal shifts, our cortisol, our body composition changes specifically, diet and exercise that we may need to change to treat these. Men and women both experience similar changes as we age. We lose a significant amount of muscle that's called sarcopenia, and we also lose bone mass called osteopenia or osteoporosis. In addition, as we age, our body fat increases or redistributes around ourselves. And women seem to feel this change more than men. We develop low grade inflammation, decrease in our energy expenditure, or we just stop burning, or we burn less calories. And we tend to also drink less water and become dehydrated. That thirst, that natural thirst mechanism decreases. There are four stages of menopause. In pre-menopause, that's our fertile years. That's when our periods are regular. We um, can get pregnant and carry a baby. We tend to have regular periods. So that usually lasts from the age of eight to 10 to 35 to 45. It can really vary in women though. And at the age of 35 to 45 is when perimenopause can sneak up on us. We may begin to experience things like insomnia, irritability, um, some sweating at nighttime. That happened to me in my mid to late 30s and I didn't even realize I was in perimenopause because I was still having regular periods. Eventually your periods become irregular and they eventually stop. The last period on average occurs for women around the age of 51, but that can vary also. Perimenopause can last 10 to 15 years. So um, just be aware of that. After our last period, the year after we experience our last period is called menopause. Menopause itself only lasts one year. It only lasts 365 days. After that, we're in post-menopause. So we spend post-menopause, we're in post-menopause for the rest of our lives. And that can be a third of our life. So it is really important that we feel good about ourselves and that we age healthfully and are strong. Everything is changing. We feel everything changing. Our middles are getting bigger. On average, we can put on five pounds during that one year of menopause alone without changing anything in our diet or exercise. And on, we'll gain about a pound and a half every year after that. We lose a tremendous amount of muscle, particularly type two muscle fibers, which are really important. This loss in muscle mass is very important for us uh, from a strength and metabolism standpoint, but also from a health standpoint. And we're gonna talk about that. We have this increase in inflammation, hormonal changes, and we're moving less and burning less calories. We may try to mitigate these changes ourselves by working out more and maybe eating less, and it doesn't work. That is not the answer when we're in post-menopause. The exercise research that uh, is typically applied to us is from research done on athletic young men and mice. It only 39% of research is actually done on women. And even less of that is done on middle-aged women like myself 
uh, who is in the peak of fat storage and muscle loss. So this is really important to understand. We need to change how we're working out and what we're doing. The exercise recommendations you're getting may not be appropriate for this stage of your life. The good news is that every woman is going to experience this if she's lucky enough to live long enough. So we're all in this together. This is a conversation we should be having with each other on what to do, how do I change it? Uh, what, who should we go to to get some help with this? Let's discuss our hormones. So when we're in premenopause, if you look at this graph, you can see the green, the nice green progesterone hormone. This hormone is nice and high when we're in premenopause. This is our calming hormone. This hormone helps us uh, relax. It helps us manage anxiety. It helps us sleep. It helps us maintain a pregnancy. This is our nice hormone. Then we also have a nice steady estrogen. As we enter perimenopause, you see that you get a drop, dramatic drop in your progesterone. And you may also notice that you're getting an increase in anxiety. You're having a hard time sleeping. This is why this drop in progesterone. Your estrogen, however, in perimenopause is trying to hang in there. So it's like going up and down, you're having irregular periods. That's your estrogen in perimenopause. Finally, in menopause, you have flat line your estrogen and your progesterone. The red line here is your cortisol. Cortisol is your stress hormone. Cortisol goes up naturally as we age. So you're going to feel your stress hormone is going to go up regardless of the drop in your, horm your other hormones, your sex hormones. So that also contributes to those symptoms of anxiety and, and insomnia. This graph shows the dramatic drop in progesterone as we enter menopause, but, and the staggering drop in estrogen, but it also shows you that testosterone, uh, our testosterone as women is not super high to begin with, but it just gradually declines as we age. So we don't usually experience a dramatic symptom of our decrease in testosterone. Melatonin, however, does go down with the progesterone. So once again, we're not sleeping. Our brain is not producing as much melatonin as it used to. So where does our menopausal middle come from? It's coming from our low estrogen, our high cortisol, our decrease in metabolism from not moving as much, an incorrect diet, incorrect exercise, and perhaps medication that we may be on. So we're gonna discuss these. Let's talk about our fat, estrogen, and cortisol. We have two different types of fat in our body. We have subcutaneous fat, which is the fat that is underneath, directly underneath our skin. It's our pinch and inch fat um, when we're young and our estrogen level is normal and high. Uh, it's a nice firm fat. It's a good quality fat. It gives us our nice round faces. It gives us our uh, firmer looking arms, our nice round derriere and fuller breasts. That is the healthy subcutaneous fat for normal estrogen levels. Now visceral fat is located within our abdomen and it is a web-like fat that surrounds our intestines, our internal organs, our intestines, our liver, our kidneys, and it even surrounds our heart. So that's visceral fat. Both of these fats have estrogen receptors on them. And when these fats, when these estrogen receptors are stimulated, they act opposite. So when we have a nice normal estrogen level, our subcutaneous healthy firm subcutaneous fat is actually stimulated to grow and maintain. So that's why we maintain our round bottom, our um, rounder breasts, and 
estrogen stimulates visceral fat to decrease. So we have flatter abdomens. T reverse that situation, reduce the estrogen, and you're going to experience a change in the consistency of your subcutaneous fat. It decreases and gets mushier and smaller cells. And you see the sagging face, the um, flabbier tricep flaps, the flatter bottom. You may actually experience thinner legs because the fat around your thighs decreases, but the decrease in estrogen also stimulates your visceral fat to increase. So you have an increase in the consistency and thickness of the fat surrounding your internal organs. Then add the increase in cortisol also that also stimulates your visceral fat. So you end up with a rounder belly just from the shift of your estrogen and cortisol. You can see in this slide, you'll see on the left is a fertile female with normal estrogen levels and she has more of a pear type of shape. And then you reduce the estrogen and you develop more of an apple type abdomen as we enter menopause and postmenopause. So the increase in abdominal fat is, uh, bothers us from a vanity standpoint. We don't feel good when we're bending over. It's kind of gross. We have, um, our clothes don't feel good. Our dresses don't fit the same, but it's really important also, more, more important from a health standpoint, okay? An increase in the abdominal fat, that visceral fat, increases our risk of metabolic syndrome. It increases our risk of heart attack by 18% for females, 6% for male. It increases our risk of stroke. It increases our risk of high blood pressure, diabetes type two, and cancers, breast, endometrial, colon cancer, esophageal cancer, pancreatic cancer, and gallbladder. Those are all increased if we have a larger abdomen and more abdominal fat. This graph I pulled out of an article from the Journal of Gerontology in February of 2020, where they followed thousands of people measuring their cortisol level as they aged, and it just documented nicely the increase in um, cortisol level as we age. This is so something that just happens naturally. This is just a fact. We have no, just the course of aging is going to cause a, our cortisol level to go up. It also, we also, when we age, have a lower threshold for increasing our cortisol. It's easier for any kind of stress to cause our cortisol level to go up even higher. So we can experience something called the cortisol steal. Cortisol steal is when we have exogenous stress put on us from, you know, kids, relationships, work, um, aging parents, any kind of stress as we age, our cortisol is going to go up even higher, okay? It's easier to send it higher. And what's important to know about that is that cholesterol, which is the precursor to our sex hormones and cortisol, is going to be shunted to create more cortisol if we have more stress. And it's shunted away from making our sex hormones. So more stress as we age results in even lower sex hormones, lower testosterone, lower estrogen, okay? So think high stress, low libido. That's, uh, that's what's occurring, this cortisol steal. We can actually cause more cortisol steal to occur by doing things we think is, are good for us. We may be over-exercising and doing the wrong exercise. We may be calorie restricting, not eating correctly, and we may not be resting enough. We're not getting enough sleep. That's huge. We may be over committing socially or with our volunteer work. We need to rest. So symptoms of elevated cortisol are actually very similar to symptoms of menopause it's almost hard to determine which symptoms you're experiencing. You're gonna have insomnia, low energy, frequent colds, 
craving unhealthy foods like carbohydrates and sweets at nighttime, salty food at nighttime, bloating, weight gain around the middle, our libido goes down, we become moody and depressed. The decrease in estrogen and increase in cortisol predisposes us to musculoskeletal injuries and we're gonna have more aches and pains in our joints and muscles. High cortisol contributes to low bone density and memory loss and night sweats too. So what do we do? What do, what do we do? Now we know that our body is changing. We know that what we've been doing all along, we may be working out the same as we've always done uh, and it's always worked for us and eating the same diet, but now things aren't working. So how do we change it? First of all, you need to start with a good physical exam. Somebody needs to take a look at your abdomen and make sure that what you're experiencing is actually adipose and it's not something else. That uh, they'll measure your belly, but you need to make sure that you're not bloating, you don't have SIBO, you don't need imaging because you have some fluid on your abdomen. You need a good physical exam. Your BMI, which is the American standard and it's on every hospital record, may not change. You, your doctor may look at it and say, no, you're fine. Your BMI is great. Don't worry about it. If that's not a good indication of any change in your abdominal circumference. And in America, the typical way to do it is just to take a tape measure, like is in this picture, around the top of your iliac crest, your, help, your hip bones, and measure your abdominal circumference. Anything bigger than 35 inches is considered obese in a female anything bigger than 40 inches is considered obese in a male. But this is not really fair. Some of us are bigger boned than others. Some of us have more uh, petite bone structure. That's not a good way to, um, to document any obesity. The World Health Organization has it right. They want you to have a waist to hip measurement ratio. So your waist should be measured at the narrowest part of your waist between your lower rib cage, your lower rib and your upper hip bone. At the narrowest part there, you take a tape measure and measure there. And at the widest part of your hips, including your buttocks, okay? That ratio is a better indication if you have abdominal obesity. Anything greater than a 0 0.85 ratio in a female is a larger abdomen is abdominal obesity. <clears throat> Greater than 0 0.9 in a male is abdominal obesity. Taking human error out of all these measurements, <clears throat> you can get a body composition analysis. And we do that here at Palm. Uh, we use a second machine where you just stand on this machine and it will objectively measure your fat and muscle distribution throughout your body. It also measures your water distribution. It it's a great objective way to get uh, an indication of your fat in your torso and abdomen, as well as your extremities. And it also measures your muscle, which we need to document because we tend to lose this as we age. We lose muscle continuously as we age as early as 10 years old, if we're not doing any kind of resistance or eating a proper diet. By 50 years old, our muscle mass begins to decrease one to 2% annually, and our strength decreases even fat, faster, one and a half percent every year. By 60, our muscle strength has decreased 3% every year. The biggest dramatic decrease in muscle mass occurs at that late menopause year and early menopause. That time frame at when you're done with your lap, your year of menopause right, and you're entering postmenopause is when we notice the biggest, most dramatic decrease in muscle mass. That's when we notice that we're kind of feeling flabbier, we don't feel good, something has changed, and that's why. So in addition to a physical exam and a body composition analysis, you should get some lab tests. You need to make sure your thyroid isn't contributing to your weight gain. You're not developing metabolic syndrome. And some women aren't even sure if they're in menopause or not, or what stage of menopause they're in, because perhaps they're not menstruating. 
they may have had a hysterectomy or an ablation or be on medication so they're not menstruating. And um, so we can get an FSH on you. We can do a Dutch test, which is a comprehensive test of your estrogen metabolites that really helps us uh, determine what stage of menopause you're in. In addition to that, you should get a four point salivary cortisol test. We do the doctor's data test here. It's an excellent test. You measure your saliva, your salivary cortisol four times throughout the day to see where you uh, range. If you look at this graph, the blue line here is normal cortisol. Cortisol peaks at 8 a.m. when you're waking up and it gradually declines until about 2 or 3 p.m. And then it eventually sloughs off for the rest of the day so you can prepare for sleep. Now, if you measure your cortisol and it's high and then it stays high throughout the day, you're running very sympathetic, very stressed out. You're in a great inflammatory state and it's gonna be really difficult to lose that menopausal middle. Now, if you have a reverse curve, which means you might be fatigued all day long, but you get a second wind at nighttime and you can be up all night. You can party all night, you can study all night. Nurses who work the night shift tend to have this reverse curve where their cortisol peaks at night, all right? That's very difficult also to, um, to lose your menopausal middle and with this kind of curve. If you have adrenal fatigue, you may have a flatline cortisol. So that's a different situation where you can't develop, you can't get the energy that you need. So here is a test that we do. This is the doctor's data test that we do here at Palm. And um, these are two different women. This first one here is a 63 year old postmenopausal female who um, was unhappy, she was not, she was continuing to do the same thing she'd always done. She was taking bar classes four to five times a week. She felt she was eating a healthy diet. She was um, doing smoothies in the morning, a salad in the afternoon and, a, and chicken breast and broccoli at eat in the evening, but she was putting weight on in her middle and she wasn't happy. We did a salivary cortisol test on her and it was normal. So it wasn't her stress but it was her diet and exercise program that needed to be changed. Once we changed that, she started to lose weight. Then over here, the second one is a 47 year old perimenopausal woman who was just beginning to have irregular periods. She was going through a divorce. She worked full time and had kids at home and she would go to CrossFit classes at eight o'clock at night, three times a week um, trying to lose weight. And her, she had a reverse cortisol, all right, because she was exercising too intensely late at night. So we had to change all of her routine too. And once we did get her exercise routine and change her diet, she also started to lose weight. Medications can contribute to weight gain too. Mood stabilizers like lithium, Antidepressants, we know, tend to increase our weight. Sleep agents like trazodone if, uh, can also put, help us put weight on. Gabapentin, we use frequently for pain control, can increase our weight. So can beta blockers, steroids, insulin, and some other medication for um, diabetes. So your, talk to your provider or your um, physician and uh, have them take a look at your med list, see what can be done. So we know that our bodies change as we age. We know our hormones shift, our body compositions change, and what we've been doing the whole time, our whole lives is not working anymore. We have to change it. So we're gonna talk about diet, stress, and exercise right now. And these are non-pharmacologic ways to manage uh, your change in your fitness. So, First, we're gonna talk about diet. You're going to hear a lot of suggestions regarding postmenopausal diet, but I'm just gonna report on the facts we know that work. 
we want to increase our muscle protein synthesis. That is very important for our ongoing postmenopausal life and health. So we have to increase our protein intake. That is mandatory, number one. We need to consume a minimum of one to 1.4 grams of protein per kilogram of our body weight, which means if you weigh 150 pounds, you need to eat at least 75 grams of protein a day, minimum, minimum. As we get older, sometimes it's harder for us to absorb protein, so we may have to eat more protein. This is mandatory for us to build muscle. Not just any protein though, we really need to get in those branched chain amino acids, leucine being the most important branched chain amino acid for us to build, pro build muscle. We have to get in three grams of protein three times a day for every meal, we need three grams of protein. That can come from turkey, chicken breast, lean dried salted beef, like a jerky, hard cheeses such as asiago and Parmesan, sardines, smoked salmons and almonds have a little bit of leucine. The um, unfortunately uh, plants do not have a lot of leucine in them. And you can see at the bottom here is a article from Frontier Nutrition from 2020 that um, gives you a really nice list of foods that you can find leucine in, common foods you can find leucine in. And I would screenshot this or you can find this in the chats and search for this article because it's a really great article. If you can't find it, just email me and I'll make sure you get it. But we need to get leucine into our diet. Uh, we have to increase our muscle protein synthesis and our type two muscle fibers as we age to keep us healthy. We do this by ingesting leucine and changing our exercise, doing the proper exercise. So other ways to increase muscle protein synthesis besides ingesting leucine through food is to supplement our leucine. I personally have to supplement my leucine. I have a hard time getting in enough protein. I have to make a conscious, you know, I have to be consciously aware of how much protein I'm getting every day. So I take Zymobol X, which we have here. You can also get other powdered leucines, but make sure you're not over supplementing. More is not better. You can get side effects from too much leucine. So more is not better, but there are supplements out there. Other ways to increase our muscle protein synthesis is through curcumin, resveratrol, EGCG, which is in green tea, DIM, and moderate amount of caffeine, like two or three cups of coffee a day. So besides getting in protein, particularly leucine, other things that work for us postmenopausally is intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding. And you should start this by not eating for the three hours before you go to bed. All right, try that for three weeks because sometimes it's a hard habit to break eating before bedtime. So don't eat for three hours before bedtime. Then after that, try to add morning restriction from eating and shoot for 12 hours of eating and 12 hours of fasting or 16 hours of fasting and eight hours of eating, uh, try to shoot for those type of ratios. This is gonna improve your insulin sensitivity. It's gonna cause some metabolic stress and help you burn some more calories. Uh, but the important thing to know is that if you are doing intense exercise also, you have to do it during your feeding window. You need to get your protein in within 30 minutes of exercise, either 30 minutes before or after, but you can't do intense exercise. You shouldn't do intense exercise during a fast, okay? You can do light exercises like your yoga or Pilates during fasting time or going for a walk, but not intense. It should be during, during your feeding window. If you have elevated cortisol or adrenal stress, limit your sugars, carbohydrates, and fruits. If you're experiencing hot flashes or night sweats, or you're just like hot and cold and hot and cold, try to eliminate your caffeine, no alcohol, no sugar, 
and really avoid your toxins, okay? Avoid perfumes, avoid deeds, avoid hair products that are smelly, avoid, uh, avoid those toxins. So for diets, increase your protein. Remember to always eat the color of the rainbow in vegetables, that, that's a given, okay? But a, a, a third of your plate needs to be protein and hydrate. Make sure you're still drinking half your body weight in water. So we talked about diet. Now let's talk about cortisol, our stress hormone. Cortisol is a needed necessary hormone in our body. It's very important to have it, but we want it to be as close to normal as possible. It's a hormone that's made in our adrenal glands. And when it's normal, it does good things. It helps us uh, manage our macronutrients. It helps us metabolize our carbohydrates, our proteins, and our fat. It keeps our inflammation down and it increases our blood sugar to appropriate levels. It also helps uh, regulate our blood pressure and keeps us awake, okay? So it would help us with our studies, with our work, uh, with our exercise. It's, it's a good hormone. However, if it's out of whack and it's too high, it can cause more inflammation in our body, more anxiety, depression, abdominal weight gain, things that we've discussed already, food cravings, insomnia, uh, when it's too high and even when it's too low. So it's kind of a bell-shaped curve. You want that sweet spot in normal cortisol. So as we discussed, as we age, our cortisol level is going to naturally increase despite anything we do. It's a consequence of aging and that's just the way it is. And our threshold for having it increase even more is higher, is lower. We can easily increase our cortisol with more minor stress. We can develop something called the cortisol steel, which shifts our hormone production away from our sex hormones that we want straight into just making cortisol. So we need to change the things that we're doing, even the things that we think are good for us. We may be overdoing and we need to change. What are ways to lower cortisol? Well, the most important thing is lifestyle changes. Let's talk about exercise. First of all, if, you're, if your adrenal gland is flatline, if you're exhausted, you should not be doing intense exercise. You should still be moving, but you need to do exercise that is not trying to demand cortisol that your adrenal glands cannot produce. We need to get your cortisol to a regular level first. So don't do high intensity exercise if you have severe adrenal fatigue. Do not exercise late at night either intensely. Do not do high intensity exercise late at night when cortisol levels are supposed to be low because we're trying once again to demand that adrenal gland to produce stress hormones. That's gonna keep us awake and that's gonna eventually reverse our cortisol curve and it may actually keep our cortisol level up throughout the day. Exercise in the morning or mid to late afternoon with your high intensity exercise or your strength training. It should be done early in the morning or to about two or three p.m., okay? When your cortisol level is naturally more elevated. In addition, to, you may need a personalized exercise program. You may need to come in and have somebody help you figure out what to do because you know your cortisol is not normal. Avoid any high intensity exercises like CrossFit, burn camp, or HIT if you have high cortisol, okay? These classes are designed for premenopausal athletes. They were not designed and tested on us postmenopausal women that have different body compositions. If you were doing HIIT workouts earlier and your cortisol is high, change to mobility exercises. If you're used to going to an Orange Theory class, change to strength training. If you do hot yoga, change to yin yoga. A spin class, just try going on a family bike ride, okay? You get the idea. You're just gonna try to decrease the intensity of these exercises. Don't stop exercising, but change your intensity. 
If you're exhausted, stop and detour. Change what you're doing, okay? Change your exercise to a less strenuous activity or you're never going to see improvement in your strength, your energy, or your abdominal circumference. Love what you do, love your exercise. You are exercising too much if you aren't feeling energetic after your exercise. If you finish exercising and you're exhausted and need to take a nap, you're over exercising, you're doing too much. If you have low cortisol, do not exceed more than 60 minutes of exercise in total three to four times a week. This includes your yoga classes, your neuroplasticity classes, your walking, okay? We're trying to get your cortisol level regulated. Other ways to lower your cortisol besides your exercise is strengthen your parasympathetic system, okay? Strengthen your, ex your parasympathetic system, which is your rest and digest system. You can do this through cardiac coherence and meditation classes, diaphragmatic breathing. You can invest in a heart rate vari variability tool like HeartMath or Elite HRV. Heart rate variability is highly correlated to our parasympathetic system, to our to balancing our sympathetic and parasympathetic system, but also to our cardiovascular health. So having a good healthy heart rate variability is really important. Sleep, 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 sleep. Sleep is mandatory, getting good quality sleep. And that's a struggle for a lot of us, but this is huge for managing our cortisol. Dr. Rateau did an excellent um, webinar on that and I refer you to that. Diet, make sure you're eating a great diet uh, with protein and vegetables, reduce your um, carbohydrates, don't eliminate them, just reduce them. You can try some adaptogens like ashwagandha or rhodiola. Supplements include TrueAdapt or phosphatidylserine, but really talk to your provider to figure out which ones you should do because there's different there's different oral adaptogens and supplements depending on if you have a high cortisol or low cortisol. Um, it's important to do the right one. You may have heard in the news last month about an article out of Science Magazine that followed thousands of people as they aged and monitored their metabolism and their weight gain. What their conclusion was, was that Yes, we all we gain weight in our middle starting in our early 40s, really, but they discovered that metabolism doesn't really start to decrease until you're in your 60s. So their conclusion was that our weight gain was due to lack of movement, lack of moving throughout the day. Now they didn't look at cortisol and they didn't look at postmenopausal women specifically but they correlated the weight gain more strongly to lack of movement. So we know that exercise can influence metabolism. That is a fact. Our exercise, however, has to change after menopause. We need to be mindful of any injuries we have too and respectful. If we have an increased cortisol and lower estrogen, we're at higher risk for any kind of tendon injuries, rotator cuff, even tendon injuries in our neck, our back. It's very important to be respectful of anything that's going on in our bodies. So we're gonna talk about four specific types of exercise that are important for us as we age. And these are non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or NEAT, high intensity interval training, or HIT, our muscle mass, and I'm including rest because it's important for us to rest while in order to manage our cortisol as we're aging. So non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or NEAT, is the energy we use other than working out or playing sports. It's how much we move throughout the day. This is 
very correlated to abdominal obesity and any obesity in general. As we age, we tend to do things that are more convenient for us. We might try to get that parking spot that's closer to the door. We might uh, take the escalator instead of the stairs. We downsize our houses to smaller houses with first floor master bedrooms. We avoid taking the stairs, things like that, okay? We, these subtle decreases in movement all add up, makes a big difference in our obesity and our metabolism. We need to start doing things like uh, standing, having a standing desk, walking and talking meetings, start fidgeting, start moving in our chairs, uh, walk to church if we can, take the stairs. If there's no physical reason that you can't take the stairs, take the stairs. Don't take the elevator up one or two floors to find the stairs and take them. And if possible, keep your master bedroom on the second floor. If there's no reason to change it, that'll keep you moving, okay? That'll increase your NEAT. We need to keep our NEAT increased particularly as we age. You can see this chart here is a graph of metabolism and activities. You have here, you have sitting is a near zero and standing is just a little bit above that where gum chewing is actually more, uses more uh, metabolic energy than standing, chewing gum. Fidgeting, look at stair climbing. That's the best thing you can do. That's one of the best things you can do. You can also walk one mile an hour. If you have a walking treadmill like Al Roker, you can walk one mile an hour or walk briskly from the back of the parking lot to your destination, all right, at three miles an hour. Those activities, anything you can add throughout the day is great. We may need to use a smartwatch or a pedometer to keep ourselves um, held accountable. Fine, do it, not a problem. Whatever it's gonna take to keep you moving, okay? And not sedentary. Because just because we go to the gym for 45 minutes a day, we need to still keep moving throughout the day. High intensity interval training. So when I was um, undergoing my training initially, uh, I was taught that aerobic exercise, long endurance exercise was the best way to lose weight. Training for marathons, riding your bike for four hours a day, uh, that would help you uh, burn calories and lose weight. It does when you're younger, but when you're older, it actually increases your cortisol. Those long duration exercises increase your cortisol. And so we know that we need to keep working on that cortisol. We should really reduce those long duration exercises and start doing shorter time, higher intensity exercises. Any high intensity interval training is documented to help boost our metabolism and keep our metabolism going throughout the day. And you do not need to spend a lot of time doing it. You can do it for as little as seven minutes a day and see an improvement. And particularly for my friends who've never really done high intensity exercise, my 70 year old friends, my 80 year old friends who've never done this, that's okay. Get on a stationary bicycle and try it, all right? You need to do high intensity interval for one minute and then rest for a minute. And then another minute of high intensity and rest for a minute. Do this kind of activity for about seven to 20 minutes, two to three times a week, and you will see an improvement in your metabolism. But you need to push yourself. You need to get to zone three or four for exercise, which means you can't talk, okay? Push yourself out of your comfort zone. You can use a heart rate monitor. Your goal is to get to 80% of your maximum heart rate which is easily obtained with 220 minus your age times 0.8, uh, or just use a smartwatch or something like that, or just get to the point that you can't talk for a minute. You can do it through different activities like stationary bicycles, treadmills, ellipticals, kickboxing. I love kickboxing. It's a great way to get your heart rate up, plyometrics, 
jumping rope for my more coordinated friends, but only do this when you're feeling good. All right, if you're exhausted, do not do hit. Go for a walk. These are the heart rate zones I was talking about. If you're going for a walk with your friends, that's great. But if you're only walking and talking and you actually could sing a song if you had wanted to, you're in zone one. So that is not going to help you with your menopausal middle. All right. It's great for other reasons. And I highly encourage you, but that's more in the neat category. You need to get up to zone three or four where you're working hard and you're really breathless. Okay. It's hard to, um, to talk. Don't do this once again, if your cortisol is high or you don't feel good. All right. Or you're inflamed. All right, switch your activity to yoga, walking, or neuroplasticity. Choose an activity that you love. You can do it with your friends because we're all in this together. You can get your friends out uh, running or jogging for uh, at intervals. I like to go to Queenie Park and I'll do a, uh, a hit run up the hills, which is really easy for me to get my heart rate up then because it's hard. Um, and you just do it for one minute and then you walk for a minute and do it for one minute and walk for a minute. Do it for 10 minutes with a group of your friends and then just take a walk after that, all right? But get out there and do what you can. And you only need to do it for a short period of time. That's the great thing. You don't have to invest like four or five hours in it. This gives you time to do other things you love. You can take a master class. You can learn a new hobby. You can play pickleball. It gives you more time in your day. This is the time to do the things you love to do. Okay, so we talked about NEAT. We talked about HIT. Now we're gonna talk about muscle mass. We're getting weaker and more sarcopenic as we age. Our muscle mass is getting lower. We are losing type two muscle fibers. Those are very important. We need our type two muscle fibers to help us with balance, to help us with quick reactions. If we trip and fall, it's those muscles that engage to help us keep our balance and steady ourselves, all right? It helps us if we drop something to catch it. It's the quick reaction muscle fibers that we lose very rapidly as we age. And we need to build those back up. We already talked about making sure you get in enough, uh, enough protein, enough leucine, because we need muscle protein synthesis. In addition to that, we need to lift weights. If there is anything you're gonna take away from this webinar, please, please start lifting weights. And you need to lift a heavy weight, a, heavy, a weight that is heavy for you. So if you do resistance training, you're going to increase your lean muscle mass and it will decrease your visceral fat. And decreasing your visceral fat and increasing your lean, lean muscle mass improves your glucose tolerance, decreases your risk for diabetes, it reduces your inflammation, and it increases your HDL, your good cholesterol. So there's many, many benefits to building muscle. Before you start, however, you need to get cleared by a doctor. If you have any kind of arthritis in your neck, rotator cuff problems, chronic headaches, don't do any weightlifting above your head, all right? That's very important. You may need a physical therapist or a knowledgeable personal trainer, which we have plenty of here at Palm to help you with the appropriate exercise program. But here are the important facts. You need to pick a weight that is heavy for you, not for your trainer, but for you. You may be somebody who's never exercised before or used a weight before. And you know you can't use that 15 pound dumbbell that your trainer's trying to uh, hand you. You may need to go to a five pound or a 10 pound. It has to be a weight that's, so, that's heavy enough that you can lift it six or eight times with good form, but that's it like you're exhausted by the last repetition, the last six or eight times, that heavy. Not one that you could do like 20 times. 
and you have to lift them slowly. So you increase the type two muscle fiber uh, growth by protein, heavy weights, and moving slowly. You're gonna wanna do a personal, a total body training, a total body exercise program two or three times a week, right? Of your large muscle mass, muscle groups. Don't do it more than that. More is not better, all right? More is not better. You're gonna increase your cortisol. Here's an example of what you can do. So for example, you can do a bicep uh, exercise with an eight pound weight and you're gonna, and that's a heavy weight for you. To, that's all you can do for six reps is the, is the eight pounds. And you're gonna curl it for four seconds and down for six seconds, up for four seconds and down for six seconds. All right, you're gonna do that like six to 10 times. And then you'll do a gluteal bridge with a 10 pound weight on your hips. You'll go up for four seconds and down for six seconds. That's slow, all right? A wide-legged squat like this lady is doing here with a 10 pound weight. And you'll go up for four seconds and down for six seconds. You're only doing six to eight reps of each of these exercises. And then you're gonna go circle back around if you can two or three times. All right, so this is a total body. This exercise program only will take you 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, okay? If you have hypermobility of your joints, you do not wanna do these exercises and you want to come see somebody. I'm happy to talk to you. I will help you with a hypermobility um, exercise program, but you don't wanna do these type, all right? Here's a day, day two. So you're gonna do this two or three times a week. This would be day two. It'll be the same muscle groups, but different exercises. So you might do an upright row or a chair dip or a suitcase squat. But the key is you're using heavy weights, you're going slow, and you're only doing six to eight reps because there's the weights are heavy enough for you. All right. If you are my friend, who either has really bad arthritis or an injury, or you've never lifted weights before, and you can't, uh, you know, five pounds is too much. You're my 85 year old friend. Age is no reason to not do this, all right? You can use a one pound weight or two pound weight, but try doing it with blood flow restrictive training. And this is really good for somebody who's um, a thinner friend who doesn't have a lot of muscle, okay? You put a band or an inflatable cuff between the deltoid and bicep and between the gluteus and the hamstring. And you do these same exercises very slowly. This blood flow restrictive training, this allows blood to flow to the muscle but it prevents venous return. It prevents return of the blood. This restricts oxygen and allows lactic acid to build up in those muscles. So it increases those type two muscle fibers and muscle protein synthesis uh, without having to use heavy weights, okay? So you'll get more bang for your buck using these type of training methods. I highly recommend it for people who have any kind of injury or can't lift the weights. It's very effective. Here's an example of what a week of exercise would look like. And remember, this is an exercise program for somebody with a menopausal middle and her goal is to just reduce that visceral fat, okay? Also, men can do this too, okay? Men are more than welcome to do this. Uh, so you might do a HIT program Monday, Tuesday, Friday. Monday, you're doing a, a exercise bike. Tuesday, you're on the treadmill. Friday, you're taking one of our great HIT classes uh, here at Palm. On uh, Thursday and Saturday, you're going to do a strength training. Okay. Three days of HIT, two days of strength training. In the evening, because you're doing your restriction on eating, you have three hours, you can go for a brisk walk after dinner, you can take a yoga class, you maybe may play pickleball in the evening, but you're moving, 
okay? You're moving. And then throughout the day, you're continuing to move. You're doing your activities with intention. You're doing your laundry while you're contracting your abdomen and you're exaggerating your movements, okay? You're standing at your computer. You're parking far away in the parking lot before you come in. You're walking briskly, you're gardening. You're, you're the one volunteering to take out the trash, all right? Because you're getting your need in, you're getting your need in. If you, however, you wake up exhausted any of these days, change your routine, change your routine. You need to take a break. This is your body calling. You need to you just go for a walk, all right? So the idea here is that you're exercising your exercise program is actually um, higher quality, but shorter time. So you're allowing your body time to rest and restore. And it also gives you time to do other things in your life. You can supplement some of these. If you find that you have more time and you wanna do more things, supplement for other exercises that can, uh, help you with balancing core, like Pilates or yoga or Tai Chi. Balancing cognition could be uh, Tai Chi dancing or neuroplasticity. Also, if you wanna do your HIIT while you're working on your balance and your bone strength, I recommend you do plyometrics, jumping side to side, hopping side to side. It's great for bone strength. And it, it uh, is your HIIT. You can also do a kickboxing class. Those are awesome. So in conclusion, we know that our body composition changes as we age. We understand that our fat and muscle completely shifts and our hormones shift also. Our cortisol is so much easier to increase. So we have to be aware of that and treat it appropriately. We need also to increase our muscle mass. And by doing that, that will help us with our safety, our ability to um, keep our balance and be stronger as we age, as well as reducing risk of metabolic syndrome. We have to increase our protein consumption and increase our resistance training and do the resistance training appropriately. We can also change our aerobic exercise program to HIT. So if you need any help, with your menopausal journey and your exercise program and your frustration, I am here to help you at Palm Health or you can talk to any of your other providers, but I'm happy to see you and I wish you all a very happy menopause. Thank you so much for joining me today.